This is Witches, Bitches, and Dead People with Intuitive Oracle, Jamie Hearn. Jamie stirs the cauldron with witches, shamans, healers, psychics, and mediums who bravely share their power and give you insight into what conversations with dead people really look like. It's probably not what you think. Sometimes hilarious, sometimes macabre, and always informative. Hello and welcome back to Witches, Bitches, and Dead People. Today, I'm so excited to chat with Carrie Arnold. She's a Gemini, moon follower, history and paranormal enthusiast, tarot reader, divination, genealogy enthusiast, cat rescue charity supporter, crystal lover, magic practitioner, magic cultivator, witch, small business owner, adjunct professor, information security professional from which she's retired, and one of our fellow weirdos, which she and I are just talking about. She also studies theta healing and chirology, which are two fascinating topics. Carrie first saw spirit when she was around eight years old. The spirit was named Mrs. Cunningham. She was simply outside dumping her metal basket of coal ashes that she had gathered from her furnace like she always did, except she had passed away the summer before. Carrie's always been fascinated with the paranormal. As a child of the woods with a wild imagination, there were always strange sights and sounds. She learned at an early age the magic of the world. Uh, As she got older, college, career, and life took over, which happens to all of us. But around eight years ago, she got reconnected to her spiritual and paranormal side, learning from people that she admires, practicing magic, and reading tarot again. She also became fascinated with her Celtic and German heritage and having researched and practiced magic based on those communities. I mean, that's a, those two pieces are probably a topic for an entire podcast episode. Um, but I want to chat with you about like all the cool things because Carrie is just magic in and of it's, uh, it's the def- she is the definition of magic. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, how did you first get interested in checking out paranormal activities in various places? Hey, Jamie, thanks for having me. Boy, that, that's a, a lot of stuff going on, right? I'm like a <laughs> avid, I'm an avid student, I would say, first of all. So I mean, I grew up in a great time. I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and there was so much extraordinary stuff on TV and content-wise. Like, just think of some of the shows, The Munsters, The Addams Family, My Favorite Martian, Lost in Space. All of these things were normal. Like, it just really stimulated your brain. Like, go to the library, read a book on aliens, read a book on Egypt, read a book on ghosts and of course as a little kid it was you know Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys so I was always into like mysteries and and researching those things Um, but the paranormal is interesting you know I started watching some paranormal tv in I don't know I'd say the 2000s most of it was just a bunch of dudes with gear and lights and things flashing which was okay but paranormal state and if you haven't watched it it's on rerun introduced some things that really spoke to me. They had mediums and they had people that were witches and they were doing things in paranormal that the other shows weren't doing. They started, I think around 2007. Um, It was a great show. I mean, there was some catastrophic things that happened with the guy that was running it later, but um, being a Penn state alum and it was just a great group of people. Alfie was a witch. And I thought, this is so interesting that she's, using magic to communicate with spirit. And then you had, you know, the guest mediums like Chip Coffee and Michelle Bellinger, who, you know, I've met personally, and they're just really interesting people coming on and reading locations. And I thought, this is so cool. You know, like, I, I really love that. Now, today in, in the paranormal TV realm, they, they do a lot of that. I think some of the shows that were just the gearheads have brought mediums in and kind of realize that you need to you need to toss it up a little bit right you need to 
look at the paranormal from different perspectives. And, and my perspective is this, and it's kind of, it's kind of, I don't want to say controversial, but how I feel about the paranormal is that everyone has a personal experience. So you can be in a room with 50 people and you're doing investigations and one person might smell something like roses and nobody else does. That doesn't mean that that person did not experience that because I believe, and you probably have the same feeling that spirits communicate with people in different ways, right? Absolutely. So why is it that anyone should judge someone else as long as you feel they're trustworthy, that they saw something that they felt something, that they smelled something, and you didn't. Like, why is that not possible? Because I think it is. I 100% agree. And I really enjoy hearing everyone else's experience because it is normally different than mine. And it just adds depth and dimension to the whole process. Exactly. And, and most of the people that I have uh, drifted towards um, or have become friends with in the metaphysical paranormal medium community are people that are open to that. Like there's some people that'll walk around and pretend they're experts in everything. Right. It, it, it doesn't fly with me. I, and I've been in like places where, I'm, you know, a medium will say to someone, well, you didn't experience that because I didn't see it. And I, that really just kind of turns me off because I right. am, I feel like people need to be, they need to open up their mind. They need to open up their senses and they need to just sit with themselves and see what comes through. Right. It's really easy. It's, it's, there's no training needed, just an open mind, really. I agree. And that perception that my experience is the only experience really comes from a perspective of ego, not spirit. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I really do. I, I, I tend to steer away from people that give themselves 50 titles in this field. So, you know, like, I'm like, if someone will ask me, like, are you a psychic? Are you a medium? Are you? I'm like, no, I'm me. You know, whatever happens, happens. And I'm, I'm pretty cool with that. But I do like to play around and experiment. I, I've been trained by people to do that. I mean, I, I joined um, the Paranormal Museum of the Occult, uh, the Greg Newkirk, Dana Newkirk Museum several years ago. And they, they do a lot of experiments with astral travel. And last weekend they were bending spoons. And it's really cool. It's a, it's a great group. And from them, I've met people all around the world that I just go and travel with and meet at a haunted location and we investigate and we do different things. And I love it. It's, it's really fun. I mean, it's, it's a, a very eclectic group of people. They all have different, you know, gifts and different things they want to experience. So we get to go and kind of play and why not? Like, why not sit in a dark room and just open your mind and see what happens. Right. It's to me, that's exciting and fun. I don't know. I agree. Why. But it is. <laughs> and it's really cool that all of those people from different backgrounds come together with this common interest. Right, right. And they all bring different gifts, right? Everybody has their own their own ways of doing things. And, and locally, I, I've been working with and helping out um, Wyoming Valley Ghost Tours, who I think you've met, uh, John and Carrie Ann. They, they do tours around the valley and then stretch out a little bit farther. Um, sometimes they just need extra help or sometimes I just go to experience the place with them. And, yeah. and I've been bringing metaphysical, um, you know, things to the table for them so that they can, we can do the, that and do, you know, the typical lights and sounds flashing, but we can also, you know, train people how to think a little bit differently about the paranormal. So that that's been really, really exciting. Um, you want to talk about some of the things we do? Like yeah, the, Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, first of all, when I go to a new place, I always read my, I always use tarot. I, I always read the cards like, and sometimes I'll read them throughout the night as things change. I just really open it up and say, I want to know, you know, what kind of experience I'm going to have, who might be here, you know, who's connected to the building without even knowing anything about the location. Usually I don't want to know the history. Um, I just want to kind of open it up. So tarot is always with me. I carry my cards all the time. It's just something I do, you know. <laughs> um, but there's other things that we like to do besides, and I would say consider like using pendulum boards and um, dowsing rods. They're kind of more metaphysical work because you're being the conduit 
um, asking the spirit to kind of use you to communicate. Um, and you can do more than just yes and no with those things. You can kind of hone in on names and things like that. But the other thing is we do, and this this is stuff that I've been taught or have I experienced, we do um, what is known as the human pendulum, which if you've done theta heta training or any kind of um, training that talks about muscle testing, it's yeah. very much the same thing. Um, you stand in the middle of a room with two people on the other side of you and you become as you become the pendulum and the person that the spirit communicates with. So. Um, as the person that's driving the session, someone will walk around and ask questions. And once they figure out what's yes or no with the pendulum, meaning the person in the middle, they move that person to answer questions. So you can kind of use um, that to not only engage and get three people into doing some testing and playing around with paranormal concepts, um, but it also does sometimes get you can get names. I mean, it's it's really interesting stuff. And Depending on the, the capabilities of the pendulum itself, people have seen visions, and it, it, it's just a really interesting way to, to investigate. So I like to do that, and that's a, it's a good way to get the crowd involved, because sometimes when you go to these events, people just stand there, they don't know what to do, so it's, it's always fun to engage them. For sure. And when they're engaged in getting to participate, I think that opens them faster. It does. Yeah. And that, well, that's a good point, too. And I always I like to open a, a, a session with grounding and getting people focused on just sending the intention to communicate while they're in the location, like as a group, like just opening their mind to, you know, allowing that communication to occur, regardless of how it happens. You know, like if you don't set that intention with a group of people at the beginning, everybody's kind of disjointed. Right. So and you know, if you believe that spirit can read your mind or communicate with you in different ways, um, you know, why not set the intention at the at the start to to kind of open up the channel, regardless of whether people think they have gifts or not. They all do. And we know right. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just a matter of getting them to understand what to do about it. Yeah. Right. And it's I find it to be rewarding to see people access gifts that they were scared to use. And in that group, it's normally a more comfortable place to do it because you're with like-minded people. The group vibration raises the whole, the whole vibration of the collective. And I don't know, I've just seen some really cool results in that setting. Yeah, I think I and I and I've worked with you in, in locations like with other groups of people and you are very much you feel the same way I do, like open it up, get people to figure out. Don't don't be afraid. Just, you know, sit back and listen to what I'm asking you to do and really participate. Don't just be, you know, an observer because life's too short to just sit on the sidelines, you know, get in totally. there, and, <laughs> get in there and go for it. Right. So, um, yeah, like that retreat you did last summer was fantastic, by the way, hopefully you Thanks. Get it, was, it was super fun. <laughs> it was, it was, it was great. Um, the other thing that we like to use, and I'll, I'll tell you a little story about the power of this method. It's called something, um, the Estes method. I don't know if you've heard it or have seen, it's basically when people, um, kind of do sight, deprivation with a spirit box, which is a box that um, captures radio signals in the area and you put it on a fast speed and you get this kind of, you know, weird sh 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 noise and you hear things or whatever. It, the purpose of it is to put on these headphones that you can't hear anybody around you, um, blindfold, so your sight and, and um, hearing de deprived, and then you go into kind of like a trance state and you open yourself up to communication. Um, that method was developed by two friends of mine um, from Estes Park, which is where the Stanley Hotel is. Everybody knows about Stanley, um, Connor Randall and uh, Carl Pfeiffer. They have a show on YouTube that you can watch, The Hauntings of the Stanley. They used to be their in-house investigators, so they, they knew that place really, really well. Great guys. But they embedded and played around with this method. So you basically get someone under the headset and you ask them questions and they just respond. And if they're really connected, they respond directly to you and you kind of build a story. But we thought we would do that, but do it a little bit differently. And so like I told you, I have friends that investigate all over the country. You know, I was in a cemetery in the Wyoming Valley um, in, a, in the meeting house and 
I was had some friends in Michigan that were in a haunted location. So we decided to do Estes between the two locations. The person in Michigan put on the headset and got the name um, Stark and they got um, look up a couple of different words. And then I went under and I got the name George and heart attack and all these different things. We were like, okay, how does that connect? So I started researching and a lot of the paranormal is researching, which is again, right up my alley. Cause I love that. Um, we found out that there was a man who had passed away. He was buried in the cemetery. I was in his name is George Stark. He died from a heart attack. I actually had a copy of his death certificate. And the next day I walked around the cemetery and I found where he was buried. And he had a huge, a huge gravestone with an angel on top that was pointing up. Awesome. So weird. There's, I mean, there was other things that happened, but that's kind of like the short story. I don't, you, there's no reason for that. I mean, I've been in that cemetery many times. There's four generations of my family. But I don't typically walk around and read other stones. And in yeah. George Stark, it was right there. I mean, it was just so bizarre. And I'm not a big believer in coincidences. So, yeah. No, I, I coincidences don't exist in my world. <laughs> I know. Synchronicities exist. Yes. Yeah. So that was really, really. And uh, as an add on to that, just to make it a little bit more enticing of how weird it was, we were actually doing Estes right by that grave site earlier that night. And the mm -hmm. person that was on the headset kept saying, go left, go left, go left. And when I was looking at the angel and looking where we were sitting earlier, it would have been a left <laughs> to get to that gravestone. Yeah. I so love George it. Clark wanted to talk that night in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. He had some energy to move. Yeah. I know. And the power of, like I said, again, opening up intentions. And that's that's kind of what you do, right? Um, the other thing I like to use, this is uh, something I've been doing for about a year and a half. I make black mirrors. And if anybody knows anything about a black mirror, it's not a bad thing. It's it's really just a scrying technique. And I've made some bigger ones because I, I, I love antiques. I used to buy and sell them. So I've collected some older mirrors and I... Or, or frames and I turned them into black mirrors and I made this fairly large oval one um, that I take with me. And I was just having people sit in front of it when we were doing investigations to get a feel for what kind of communication they would get. And one of the things I did as a witch is not only did I energize the mirror, but I also put a, a protection spell on it. So nothing and I'm not a big, I don't believe in demons. I just want to tell you that I've, I've been doing this for a long time and never come across anything that's demon like um i would say there's there's cranky spirits <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> sometimes um sometimes they might poke and pull your hair only because they're trying to figure out a way to communicate with you they're not trying to hurt you they're just trying to reach out um so but just in case um that so that nothing comes through but people have sat in front of it and seen their faces change into something um we did it at a location and this one girl saw her grandmother who had just passed away like about a month ago and she mm. cried. It was, it was rather emotional. There was another guy that sat in front of it who was definitely a skeptic. I mean, you could tell like skeptic when you're just, you know, yeah. sitting in a room and people are just kind of, but he sat in front of it for a good long time. And when he moved away, I said to him, I said, did you see anything? He said, yeah, for some reason I saw my brother. I said, Oh, that's interesting. He says, yeah, he passed away like six years ago. Yeah. But now I've been starting to think more and I use, I carry a black mirror with me to hold in front, look at it and kind of look behind me to see, and I've seen shadows and things move in it. But now I've, I've got some ideas to do some experiments with the mirror and Estes that I want to try. Ooh. Yeah. That sounds exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have some thoughts on if someone's is someone is sight deprived and hearing deprived and you're asking questions behind them and they're ex just describing what they see in the mirror, does that match? Right. I would love to see how that turns out. I know. I know. I, I can't wait. It's kind of exciting. I love playing around with stuff like that. You don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. That's the beauty of paranormal in my mind. Yeah. It's not predictable at all. No, 
it's always an adventure. Yeah, it never gets boring for me. Never. <laughs> Even if it's just What's hanging out with a bunch of girl, you know, a, go, a bunch of women that I really love. I mean, that's that's still the fun part of it too, you know. Yeah, that's that's a powerful element of it. What's one of your favorite sites that you've investigated? Uh, there's a lot, but I would tell you the only time I ever got scared, I mean, scared to the point where I really wanted to run out of the place was the attic of the Ohio State Reformatory. That building is mm. the building that they used to film the Shawshank Re Redemption, if you've ever seen that movie. Yeah. It's a huge complex. There's prison cells. There's, there's, I mean, you could be there for days. And I went there with, we rented it with like 20 people, but we all split up. But the attic there was a very, very ugly event that happened there and the energy up there was palpable. And they and they said you would see like these lights like shoot down the hallway of the attic and that you see these little pin lights. It's very strange. It's kind of like seeing fairy lights, but they were white. But the energy in there made me wanna crawl out of my skin. I mean, I, I have never felt that panicked or, um, and I think it was mostly residual energy, which is when there's stuff left behind that kind of plays yeah. like a movie. But I've never felt that that scared in my life. And that was a place that I'll probably go back to someday and see if I still have that same feeling. But and it could have been energy that was built up from people that go there that know the story, you know, that that lays there too. people generate their own energy and infuse it in places. So but, um, I love Gettysburg. I've been going there since I was 16 probably been there about 80 times oh wow it's an amazing place um there's a lot of residual there too but the energy is just an interesting i don't find it negative even though there was a lot of blood and death um i i more think of it as lessons learned and and as a cautionary tale of how um we can destroy each other which you know, in times like we have now, there's there's probably a good reason to remember what happened in Gettysburg. Um, right. But it's a it's a it's a battlefield and the only one in the nation that's still intact. You can't build on Gettysburg. Um, everything that's there was there during the Civil War battles, and it was a three day battle. Um, when Lincoln came and did his address, um, he claimed it sacred ground. So there's Nothing there that wasn't there before. They even grow the same crops in the field that they grew that back then. So it's pretty much walking into history. If you like history, it's a great place to go. Have you ever been anywhere like Alcatraz? Um, I have been to many jails. I visited Alcatraz years ago, but it was just a tour. I didn't really do any investigations. Um, famous location, locations that people might know, the Stanley, um, you know, the one that Stephen King wrote about. Um, in the shining that place has got some pretty crazy energy yeah it's it's definitely a weird place um mount washington is really cool that's in mm. vermont it's a beautiful location up in the mountains but it's, it's also got its own history and its own um energy I, as far as towns and places to visit like that i i love new orleans if you have never been there that's a place that i like to go to that place has got crazy energy um, Savannah. Yeah. That's you can walk list. around and you can feel the, the, the spirits moving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that there. But yeah, there's, I mean, I don't know. There's so many places that I've gone to some that, you know, I would never go back to again, again. Um, others that I can't wait to go back. I'm going back to Hillview in Pittsburgh, outside Pittsburgh at Newcastle this weekend. So that place had some crazy stuff. I actually saw fog manifest in the basement. That place is Oh, weird. wow. Yeah. Very, very strange. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, we even have pictures of it. Yeah, it was just, it was just there. And then it left. I mean, I mean, basements, don't get me wrong, can be, you know, full of moisture, but... Mm -mm. it was it was not just that it it just and you could barely see the doorway it, and it would happen to be an exit door so it glowed red so you could actually see the fog it was, it was very weird yeah so hopefully. that's so neat i love it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so 
all that's fun, but I, I finally retired. So I get to do a little bit more than um, I was doing originally. I, I was an information security IT gal for a long, long time. I still teach up at uh, uh, Misericordia University, uh, some classes here and there as an adjunct just to stay connected to the technology. But mostly what I do is raise money for cats. I have a business. Yeah, called. let's talk about that. Yeah. Tell so us my, about your passion for animals. Yeah, I well, I've all, we've always had animals all of my life. I've loved um, dogs, and um, you know, it's interesting. I never got, I never had a cat until I started um, traveling a lot for corporate work, and it was. I wanted dogs when I had my own apartment, but it's just you know they need more human connection. They need someone to walk them and. They're, they're just different. They're different personalities. They just really need their people. Cats do too. Don't get me wrong, but they can be a little bit more independent. So I started with one and then I just started learning about the tragedy of, of how humans treat and still treat cats. They feel like they can just toss them out at any time. They, you know, it doesn't matter if they go outside. Well, it does. Um, there's things out there that want to kill them, including humans. And people get a kitten and raise it for two or three years and decide to move and say, oh, I can't take the cat with me. And they'll just toss it outside. They'll survive. Well, they might for six months, but um, it's, it's a big problem. It's, you know, there's colonies that people take care of and then that's a great thing. They get them fixed and neutered. And I help out people that do that work, the TNR work that trap and neuter re-release the cats that can't become domesticated just so they have a life to live for as short as it will be. Um, and then I also help the fosters that take cats and kittens and try to find them new homes. There's so many medical bills and all over Wyoming Valley, there's women mostly that just, you know, take care of these cats in groups of 20 and 30 and just try to get them, you know, good homes. And wow, you know, food alone is, is expensive, but you know, when they come in from the outside, a lot of times they have, you know, infections in their eyes and some of them have, you know, been shot by BBs and have to have amputations and there's all kinds of, you know, medical bills. So I, I work with crystals and I started selling crystals. I have a fairly large um, online presence. My, my private group is crystals for whiskers, easy name to remember um, that I sell from <laughs> to raise money. And I, and since I've been retired, I've been doing events and, and taking stuff with me and, and doing some witchy crafts and stuff like that to, to sell around the area. Um, so a portion of my profits goes right to the, the hands of fosters and rescues, whoever, I just follow them. And when somebody needs money, you know, I'll send them money. No rhyme or reason. I don't, I just know they need it. So. Well, that's what you really are a great resource. Cause I mean, I've reached out to Carrie, my mom, there's a memo out in the neighborhood that any stray cat that's looking for a meal goes to my mom's porch. Yeah. <laughs> so, she she likes to catch them and at least have them spayed and neutered so she had caught this one and it was so cute it was tiny and it was really stressed like it was crying and it was trying to get outside so i i messaged carrie and i'm like what do i do with this like <laughs> i'm taking care of my 92 year old grandmother and a cat that's very unhappy but Carrie yeah. talked me through it and, and the cat ended up going to the vet and the vet fell in love with it and it got a new home and everyone was happy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I have, I have three cats now. I have, I have my cat Prince, who's the, the most friendly cat of all of them. Um, but the interesting story about him is he escaped from a dog fighting ring in Florida. When they found him on the street, he was, he was, he's a great cat with white markings. He was, he was inked purple um, because he was the next one that was going to be tossed in the ring for the dogs to rip apart. Oh. But he, he figured out how to get out of his cage and took off. He was a wily thing. He, he wants to go out like all the time. So like the door opens, he knows my routine. Like he literally will run in front of me and he has gotten out once. Um, and he really just stops in the front yard because there's so many smells. He can't stand it. He's just stopped. But he's an escape artist, so I have to be careful with him. I don't let my cats out. They have a little patio they can go out on. Um, 
but Prince is crazy. His uh, nickname was Mr. Purple Paws when I, when I got him because he was purple. But he passed away around the time that Prince died. So, oh, yeah. So his name is Prince and he is a prince. He loves people, hates dogs, <laughs> hates them. He will attack them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't like being in a, in a, in a cage in a, because they caged them right with the dogs and the dogs well, just bark and scream at, you know, try I'm to get sure. Out yeah. that there's that's a trauma response from yeah, where it he is. came from it definitely is yeah so they all have a different story my little girl came from a nanocoke colony she's missing um bones in her one front paw so her paw is doesn't touch the ground it's kind of she holds it like a punching glove um it, it's she's not a you know they don't need to amputate it but she and she knows how to get around but you know she's just got a few little minor flaws but she's she's so cute she's eight pounds and she runs the the household she tells the two boys what to do and not to bother her so i love that and i yeah. mean we have our own quirks so why wouldn't they yeah yeah and female cats tend to be a little spicy yeah <laughs> she's well, my we only, female we only have a male cat in the at our house that we yeah. inherited yeah and he runs the show mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> I love cats. They're great. They're all, they all have different personalities. So, um, but, but helping them is, you know, just something I feel good about. I don't, you know, I'm retired. So I, I am not, you know, I'm not made of money. I, I still got to pay medical bills that, you know, until I can get, you know, on federal funded stuff. So um, I still do part-time work, but anything I can give them, I, I'm more than willing to help out. Well, and we'll drive some traffic to Crystals for Whiskers. We'll make yeah. sure we include a link so people can help your great. endeavor to support the cats. That'd be great. Thank you. Well, I love chatting with you, Carrie. And next time when you come back, I want to dig into the history of your lineage and how that's impacting your practice. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I have um, a German side with Pennsylvania Dutch, and the Pennsylvania Dutch actually practice magic, they call it powwowing. So if you ever, if you were interested cool. in what they do, look up powwow Pennsylvania Dutch, there's full books about um, the magic that they practice, and it's all natural based, of course, you know, think Amish, they're very much not connected to electricity or technology or anything like that, yeah. but um, yeah, like my grandmother, just a small thing. She used to, when I would get a wart, she would take a potato and cut it in half and rub it on the wart. And then she would go out in the yard and bury it. I love that, it. That was her solution for getting rid of warts. And it worked. Yeah. 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 I don't know. She always just do weird little things. I mean, just because that's the every day that's what they do they they practice and live it i mean the celtics are very much like that too so i am traditionally mostly welsh um my my father's family came over from wales but i have a little bit of scottish and irish in me so i'm very connected to that community uh, most of my magic and uh, deities that i connect with are celtic so cool I'm actually publishing a book on Celtic goddesses right now. So Ooh, I will have to connect. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Bridget, I, I love them all. I do. I do. Yeah. Yeah. For it's, sure. It's, it's a great um, way to play um, around with your magical side. This just, just be connected to the goddesses. Yep. Can't wait to I read love it. it. Yeah. Carrie, thank you for spending time with us today. It's been fascinating. Thank you. Hopefully I didn't uh, talk too fast or ramble too fast. I mean, that's a Northeast thing, isn't it? Like we all talk fast. <laughs> well, the beauty of podcasting is people can slow it down and listen to it at whatever speed they like. Of course, I speed it up, but yeah. you know. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you, Jamie, for having me. Thanks everyone for listening. See you next week on Witches, Bitches, and Dead People. Peace and badass magic. Thank you for listening to Witches, Bitches, and Dead People with Jamie Hearn. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in. 